everyone and um, I've just started the the recording of the uh, lecture and uh, I'm just looking at the questions in the chat so we will look at um, some of these questions that have come to us uh, respond to them so there's a question here from uh, Divya uh, where the question is uh, that though we are free from condemnation uh, and the consequences for sinful actions. So example, if somebody's been a chain smoker before coming to Christ, now they come to the Lord, of course they are made righteous, but what about the effects of you know what they've done on on their on their body? Uh, will they, do they still have to go through the consequences? So the answer is yes, but we have to factor in the mercy of God. So, yeah, if a person does something wrong, uh, in the eyes of God, they are justified, but the consequences are still there. You know, whether, as in the example that's given, you know, the smoking, there'll be the effects of smoking on their physical body. Or if there was a crime that was committed, there will be the, you know, the legal aspects of the crime here on earth. So those things are there. But we have to factor in the mercy of God. What happens? When a person becomes a believer, they are now recipients of God's grace, God's mercy, God's intervention in their lives. Which means that because of his mercy, because of God's mercy at work, in most cases what we will see is that there is a shortening, there is a decrease in, the, in even the effects of the wrongdoing because of the mercy of God. So in the case of somebody who, you know, who've been, has been a chain smoker example, the mercy of God can either decrease the effects of what they have done on their physical bodies or maybe even turn around, uh, reduce it or you know, eradicate it completely, the mercy of God. So it is true in the natural, they will face the consequences of it. But uh, as they look to God in his mercy and say, God, you know, this is what I've done. I ask you to heal me. I ask you to reverse whatever damage has been done. God in his mercy can do that. Uh, same way for other things that, you know, God will intervene in his mercy and cause a change. So the answer to your question is, yes, we have to face the consequences. But that's where we look to God for his mercy to intervene in those consequences. So it's like this, uh, and I may have mentioned this before. Grace gives us what we do not deserve. Mercy withholds the severity of, our, of the consequences of what we do deserve. So mercy holds that back. Mercy rewrites our life. Mercy gives us a new chapter. And we may ourselves have written, you know, the final line, the final sentence of our lives. Mercy gives us a new chapter in our lives. Uh, there's another question. Okay. Um, there's another question from Isaac. Uh, so, he, uh, so the question is. Uh, you know, basically Isaac is sharing that, you know, this understanding of justification, uh, uh, that we are no longer condemned by God because of what Jesus did, case is closed, but um, there's Satan's lies, accusations. And because of that, people, you know, the love for God grows cold. Uh, they wander away from God. They just, you know, just stray from God because of the accusations. and. Uh, you know, how do we bring them back? How do we bring these souls? So uh, that is a good, good question. And um, you know, um, 
one uh, uh, here here's some thoughts one is uh, it's always good to be pre preventive as far as the church is concerned it's good for us to be preventive so one of the preventive <laughs> sorry one of the preventive measures we can do is to present the truth of God's word to his, to his people right constantly remind them present the word so that way people are established in God and they don't wander away however for those who have already you know become cold wandered away what do we do two things I, I can think of one is we can definitely pray so through our prayer we can intervene um, on their behalf and secondly we can you know we can bring the word of God to them so that uh, they get to know the truth and uh, you know then the, the truth will once again you know revive their hearts and revive uh, and their passion for Jesus Christ. So um, ideally, we should be in a preventive mode. That means, you know, keep giving the truth so that this doesn't even happen. But if it does happen to some people, we pray for them. Then we can bring the word of God to them, help them, you know, to whatever extent they are willing to receive uh, so that they can then come back and become strong. Okay. I hope that helps. Uh, all right. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so we've got to uh, continue going forward and maybe we'll take more questions towards the end of this lecture. I'm gonna go ahead and share the PDF so we can continue from where we paused. Right, so what we were saying is this is a second aspect uh, the second way we apply this truth uh, in our lives that when we pray we go before god with boldness and confidence you know we come boldly to the throne of grace we come boldly to god's throne right we come knowing that we can obtain mercy and find grace so that's how we come Right. We don't come in there like I was, as I was, as, as I said towards the end. We don't try to sneak in, you know. We don't need to come through a third party. No, we come boldly. You come boldly before God. So uh, that means, you know, the way we pray changes. So we don't pray and say, "Oh God, you know, I'm such an unworthy person." Uh, I have no right to come into your presence. I mean, all of that is true, but we need to acknowledge what God has done. You know, so rather than talking about how you were once far off, you acknowledge that you've been brought near because that's the present. You don't have to keep on talking about the past. God's not interested in it. The Bible says he's, he's buried them in the depths of the sea. He has removed the past as far as the east is from the west. So there's no point for us going and bringing it from there and reminding God about it. No need. Just accept what he's done. So when we pray, say, Father, I thank you. I can come into your presence boldly, Lord. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, the privilege of entering your presence with confidence, Father. Thank you uh, that I could come before you freely by your grace. And thank you I could love you, Father. Thank you for your love. So we, we pray in line with the truth. You know, so even our prayer changes. Sometimes, you know, uh, we may have prayed. Uh, uh, in line with our past. Oh God, I'm so unworthy. I'm such a sinner, God. Oh God, I'm such a you know worm. God, I'm good for nothing. And and you know it actually. We are trying to make ourselves feel good by praying like that, but you're not doing anything honorable before God because you're not honoring His truth. You're just making yourself feel good by praying that way. It's no, it's no point. What we must do is. Pray in line with the truth, which is God's word. And God's word is, is telling you who you are. God's word is telling you how you can come into his presence. So you pray with your hands lifted high and you know, you know with, with freedom, with joy, uh, as you talk to a God. That's the way he wants us you know, to come. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Right. So now if we do something wrong, 
then of course we have to confess it. But don't live in self-condemnation or self-accusation. So you see, that's the problem with many of us. We, we are people who feel good by condemning ourselves or making ourselves feel like we are nothing. Many people do that. They make themselves feel good by self-condemnation, self-accusation. But John is telling us, look, if our heart condemns us, you know, God is great and he knows all things. So you don't have to go and condemn yourself. God already knows the wrong. He knows the past. But if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And we need to be in this place where our heart does not condemn us. Now, how can you, you and I be in a place where our heart doesn't condemn us? And our heart understands and receives the truth. If a heart does not understand and receive the truth, they're going to have a heart that is living in self-condemnation and self-accusation. And God knows. God knows better than that. God knows he's greater than our heart. He knows everything. He knows that what you're doing is just because of a lack of knowledge. It's just you condemning yourself. It doesn't mean anything to him. He's greater than your heart. So what must we do? Let your heart be established in the truth. Let your heart dwell in the truth so that it's a heart that is free from self-condemnation, self-accusation. You and I must have confidence toward God. We are people who have confidence toward God. Uh, there's another passage in Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Uh, I would just request somebody to please read this for us. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22, please. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a higher priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our boldness watched with pure, pure water. Okay. Amen. Thank you. So the writer of Hebrews is kind of drawing an imagery from the Old Testament tabernacle. And then he's, uh, he's trying to kind of, you know, get people to understand New Testament truth. So the background imagery is the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament tabernacle, when people came to worship God, that tabernacle had three compartments. There was the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place. Uh, so in the outer court, there was the altar of sacrifice. There was also, there, sorry, there was the wash basin, labor of uh, washing. It was a place where the, you know, the priest or the people would wash their hands. And then there was the altar of sacrifice. So it's kind of, and then of course, in the Holy of Holies, there was the, the veil, the thick curtain. Uh, beyond that curtain, only the high priest could go. But when Jesus died on the cross, we know what happened. That veil in the temple was rent in two. It was torn apart supernaturally by God as a sign that uh, it no longer is there. So the writer of Hebrews here is borrowing those images and telling, giving us a message. So he's telling us we have boldness to enter the holiest. That means the place where only the high priest used to go. Now every believer can enter that place. Can you imagine in the Old Testament, uh, only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies and he would go there only once a year. But here in the New Testament, he's saying, hey, every believer has boldness to come to this place, the holiest place, of, you know, through the blood of Jesus. And then he says, we... Uh, he has opened up this way for us and he has consecrated it for us. He's, he's given it to us. How? 
through his own flesh. That means when he was crucified on the cross, this veil was rent in two. So he says, you know, for new believers, for, for us believers in the New Testament, he says, look, I'm giving you this new and living way. You can go right into the presence of God. And I am your high priest or the house of God. Jesus is the high priest. So in view of that, he says, let us draw near. Let's just get as close to God as you want. Get as close to God as you want. Draw near. With a true heart in full assurance of faith. That means come with faith in your heart. Full assurance. Full assurance of faith. Come with faith and full assurance. And this having a true heart or a heart that is free from an evil conscience. So he's kind of drawing a parallel, you know. Uh, in the Old Testament, they washed their bodies with water. You know, so when people came to worship God, the first thing was this basin of water. So they washed themselves with water. So he's drawing a comparison. He says, okay, here we're not really washing ourselves with water. Here we're cleaning our conscience. Get, in, get rid of that dirt from your conscience, your own conscience that missed accusation and condemnation wash it off with the water now the word of god is water with which we wash so there's a parallel in the old testament they washed their bodies literally with water in the new testament we come with a heart that is washed sprinkled or washed with uh, the evil the con evil conscience but evil conscience is a con conscience that is con self-condemning self-accusing get rid of that Wash it with the word of God so that you and I can come with full assurance of faith. We can go have boldness to enter the most holy presence of God by through the blood of Jesus. So that is the second implication of being made righteous. We come boldly in the presence of God. Get rid of an evil conscience. Don't condemn yourself. Don't accuse yourself. Don't make yourself, you know, don't uh, belittle yourself. Don't beat yourself down. No, get rid of that. God doesn't want you to do it. Just come boldly to the presence of God. The third aspect of uh, this whole issue of uh, being made righteous and justified in God's eyes, we mentioned, is that we can rule in life. Rule in life because of the gift of righteousness. Can somebody read Romans 5, 17 for us, please? Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by the one man's offense death reigns through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, whom is he talking about? He's talking about those who receive. So, some of us people, we have received abundance of grace. I mean, God has like, poured out buckets and buckets and buckets of grace on us. Abundance of grace. And he's given us the gift of righteousness. Think about that. Righteousness, which is what we've been talking about, is given it to us as a gift. He's given to us the gift of righteousness. He's given to us abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. So he's saying, those who receive, the people who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, what will, what will we do? We will reign in life through Jesus Christ. We will reign in life. Who reigns? A king. A king rules. A king reigns in life. Now, the context there of Romans 5, we have to understand. Let, let me just share that with you. So what he's saying is this. You know, one man 
sinned, one man offend. So Adam sinned. Death reigned. Adam sinned, death ruled. Adam sinned, death ruled over us. Adam sinned, we were all made subject to the consequence of that sin, which included we were brought in subjection to sin, Satan, and death. One man sinned, we became subjects. We were put under sin, Satan, and death. So death reigned over us in life. So as we're journeying through life, because of Adam's sin, sin, Satan, and death is overpowering us, controlling us. But then, Jesus came. He is the last Adam. The first Adam put us in subjection to sin, Satan, death. The last Adam, Jesus Christ. The second man, Jesus Christ. What did he do? He gave us abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And he said, because of that, you are going to reign. That means whatever Adam put us under, Jesus placed us over. Let me repeat it again. Whatever Adam put us under, Jesus placed us over. That means you and I are ruling over sin, Satan, and death in life. He's saying, in life, that means in this life. That means because we have received abundance of grace and we have received God's gift of righteousness, we have been positioned to reign, to rule in this life over sin, over Satan, over the things that destroy our lives. Death means... I'm not just talking about physical death, but over the things that lead to that, things like sickness, things that destroy our lives. We are ruling over those things. So everything Adam put us under because of the fall, Jesus has put us over to rule and reign and dominate and have mastery over and authority over because of grace and righteousness. So, what does righteousness do for us? The gift of righteousness puts us in a place where we will reign in life. So we must understand, understand this truth, embrace this truth. I'm going to reign in life. I'm going to walk in mastery over the things that dominates, used to dominate me, control me because of Adam's sin. I'm going to rule over it. So I'm not going to sit down and accept what life brings just like that. No, I'm going to rule over. I'm going to exercise authority and dominion over those things. And that's why, as the Passion Translation says, you know, because of Jesus, we are going to live a victorious life now. A victorious life is now available to all. So what kind of a life are we able to live because of the righteousness? We are going to live a victorious Victorious life now in Jesus Christ. So I want us to understand this truth that, you know, uh, this 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 righteousness, the gift of righteousness, it makes us live in a place of authority and dominion in Christ. Uh, that doesn't mean you know we're not going to physically die. Of course, we're going to die physically. But up until that time, up until we physically die, we understand that we are going to rule in life. So when you face adverse situations, when you face difficulties in life, always look at it as a person who can dominate it. You are a king in life, so to speak. You're going to dominate it. Life will bring its adversities. 
life will bring its difficulties. There are the consequences of sin, Satan, and death, and you know, at work all around us. We will face these things, but you face them as somebody who rules over them. How does a king rule? He speaks words of authority and dominion. He issues his decrees over those things. So when they when you face these things in the name of Jesus, I dominate this. In the name of Jesus, I you, know, you speak what you uh, the, the outcome you want to see in those circumstances and situations of life. You say, how can I do it? Because you have received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. God said you will reign in life. Just take him at his word. I'm going to reign in life. I'm going to dominate everything Adam put us under. I'm going to dominate those things. And I'm going to overcome sin, Satan, and death, the things that work death. I'm going to overcome that. I'm going to live over that. Okay? Now let me just uh, finish a few more thoughts and then we will take questions. Uh, now the important thing is that righteousness is an armor, the armor of righteousness. So the Bible says, take, on, take the whole armor of God and part of that armor is the breastplate of right, righteousness. So righteousness is like a breastplate. It covers, you know, your, your entire, the front of your body. It's a protective thing. So righteousness is a armor. It's something we use in our conflict against the enemy. There's another place in Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 7. Uh, it says, you know, the armor of righteousness. So it is a weapon against the enemy. See, righteousness gives us something that Satan does not have. I want you to know that. Righteousness gives us something Satan does not have. It puts us in absolute, in, in right standing with God. Satan doesn't have it. Immediately, we are in a huge advantage against Satan and his demons. Many believers don't even know that. You know, people are always afraid. Believers, I'm saying, are always talking about, you know, what the devil is doing to me. He's attacking me. He's doing this. He's, hey, know the truth. The truth is, you have righteousness. Satan does not. You're already in a place of huge advantage. You're in right standing with God. Satan wished he could have it, but he cannot. You're already positioned for victory. So instead of saying, oh, the devil is doing this against me, you say, devil, listen to me. Satan, listen to me. So how can you talk like that to Satan? Well, you have righteousness, he doesn't. You're at the right hand of the Father, he's not. You're in a place of dominion authority, he's under your feet. So Satan and all his demons are under your feet. So talk like that. Act in line with the truth. You are a person who has righteousness. And so say, Satan, you listen to me. Demonic powers, you listen to me. Unclean spirits, you listen to me. So when you and I confront demonic powers, when, whether you're ministering to people or so on and so forth, you know, you confront them with a sense of authority and dominion. I remember once... Uh, this was in actually in a pastor's conference we were doing, and this is a very unusual place for something like this to happen. And uh, uh, this was a pastor's conference. We were actually in Varanasi. So Varanasi is a city uh, towards the northern part of India. And we were having a pastor's conference there. And uh, now you don't expect demonic manifestations in a pastor's conference, but this happened, real. So, uh, you know, this was, uh, so we were teaching, we were ministering to pastors and all of that. And uh, this was this, you know, I think this was a session. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, it was a session right after lunch break or something like that on on, on, on a second day. And uh, I had finished ministering the word of God. I just told everybody to stand, the pastors, you know, we had uh, a gathering there, uh, I, I, and I, again, my numbers may not be correct, but you know, uh, it must have been about less than 200 people. So we told them all to stand, we're just praying, and suddenly I felt, you know, in my spirit, take dominion over demonic powers. 
Now, this is a pastor's conference. These are people who are in Christian ministry. They've been you know, serving God in some way or the other. Some may be starting out in the ministry. Some may have been in the ministry for a long time. But I don't know, it's like a strange place to rebuke evil spirits. But I just follow my spirit at that moment while I'm praying. Hey, take dominion over evil spirits. So I just said, Satan, I take authority over you. Now, you know, this, these are pastors, pastors all standing in front of me. The moment I said, Satan, I take authority over you, a man who's, I, I think he was in the second or third row from the, from the altar, from the front of the, um, so this was in a, we were having this meeting in a, in a church building. So he was like right there in, in the third row suddenly started uh, just shouting, screaming. So the demons inside him started manifesting and people, you know, moved out and he came right up to the front. So here I was standing there with an interpreter because uh, well, the preaching was being interpreted into Hindi, standing in front. And he had this man who had just become so violent. Uh, he came right up in front and uh, started shouting all these things. He, he was speaking in Hindi and I was responding in English. I mean, when I say he, it means the demons in him. Speaking out, screaming stuff in Hindi. And I, I didn't fully understand what he was saying. Usually I can understand a little bit of Hindi, but this time I couldn't understand fully what he was saying. He was saying all kinds of things. And you know, in his, in a, when, when, when a person is manifesting evil spirits, you know, of course, the, the, the body becomes so stiff and they become very strong suddenly because uh, their strength is now coming from those evil spirits inside them. So you can imagine it, it really shocked everybody because here's a man who's supposedly, I don't know, being a preacher or whatever, and now he's manifesting. And, and I could see in you know, front a lot of people taking out their mobile phones to record what's happening, you know, but I, I, I didn't know what he was saying. He was shouting and screaming something, but I just said, Satan, I take a thought over you. I command you to come out of this man. So, so the first thing is not to be afraid at all because you know who you are in Jesus. You know, you are righteousness and the devil can only pretend to be strong. He can only pretend to be powerful. He can only pretend to be violent. He can only pretend to be aggressive. It's all a pretense. And you know who you are in Jesus. So I just stood very calm, not moved. So Satan, you're going to listen to me. Command all your demons that are inside him. Come out. You know, and he kept shouting even more. So I was just like, okay, I'm just being calm. Then I said, you know what? Let's put on a show. So I did this. Uh, you know, I don't normally do this uh, when ministering deliverance. But that day I said, let's purposely put on a show. And I said, Satan, I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, you're going to bow your knee. So all these people, and of course the interpreter is interpreting in Hindi. So just making it a little dramatic. So all the people are watching. I said, one, two, three. And you won't imagine. I just counted one, two, three. When I said three, this man who was with, you know, demon possessed, he lifted up his hands and he went on his knees. in front of everybody. So that's the kind of authority you and I have as believers because we are the righteousness of God. And then I just rebuked him. I said, all you evil spirits, come out of him. And the man fell flat on the ground. So nobody laid hands on him. It wasn't a long, uh, drawn out battle, nothing. Those demons, I don't know how many demons were in him or whatever. Uh, Sometimes, you know, God gives you an understanding through the discerning of spirits to know how many evil spirits are there and all that. But in that case, nothing happened. I just just stood in my authority. He was making all the noise and acting all violent and all of that, but just stood calm, rebuked him, and just made it a little bit dramatic. I said, I'll count to three above your knee. Sure enough, I counted one, two, three. At the count of three, he went on his knees. 
And in the name of Jesus, cast all those spirits out. So he was lying flat on the ground for some time. I continued, you know, just praying for other people. And then, you know, after I, I don't know the duration of the time, but he must have been down for about 10 minutes or so. And then he woke up uh, completely delivered. The point I'm saying, the reason I'm sharing that, and like this, we've seen so many, you know, cases of people being ministered to. The, the point is this. You have righteousness. Righteousness is your armor. Satan doesn't have it. So when you're confronted with evil spirits or ministering deliverance or dealing with demons, just know that you have something that protects you. It's the righteousness of God. It's your armor. So if you want to imagine this, okay, just as an imagination, this is you. You're surrounded with light. That's your armor. That's your righteous, God's righteousness around you. You're surrounded with this light. The devil cannot come close to you. Because you have an armor of righteousness. Now, when believers don't know it, that's when the devil defeats them. By saying, oh, you can't do it. You're so weak. Uh, and he pretends, right? He pretends to be so strong. He can only make a lot of noise. That's what the Bible says, like a roaring lion. He doesn't have the strength of a ro roaring lion, but he pretends to be like a roaring lion. And believers get intimidated by the noise he makes, by the roars he makes. But when you know righteousness is your armor, you have something Satan does not. You act in absolute mastery and dominion over Satan and all his demons, they have to listen to you. Okay, so that's what righteousness gives us. It gives us absolute, a sense of absolute mastery over Satan and his demons. Last point in this, in this thing. Uh, we must, you know, we must uh, walk in a fellowship with God. I think last one or last two. We must walk in fellowship with God in righteousness. So this brings us to that thought where you know, if, uh, if, uh, uh, if, uh, so righteousness is not only a uh, right standing with God, uh, it is a quality of being right, the nature and character, but also has to do with right action behavior. So that means we live right before God. Now, sorry, uh, you know, when we sin, sin must be acknowledged. You know, there is no such thing as holy sin. You know, if a believer commits sin, it is sin. And we don't say, oh, just because I am right in God's eyes, uh, God overlooks it. No, we have to confess. So the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, the Bible says uh, that we, when we walk in the light, as he is in the light, God is in the light, then we fellowship with him. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, that moment, that very moment, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the moment we confess, everything is washed clean and everything is you know, clean and righteous and we can walk freely before God. All right. So that brings us to the end of this, this section. I... I, I, I thought we'll be able to get into the next section today, but I guess it's going to be next week. But this is uh, very important and it's worth spending the time uh, on this. So uh, uh, I would just like to keep the next 10 minutes for, uh, for uh, uh, yeah, question answers. So could uh, you know somebody, I mean, those who want to ask questions, Oh, you're welcome to do that. Okay, Sonia, see your hand raised. Please go ahead. Um, I know you were saying that you take your authority. One of says, but how do you apply that in terms of healing? Like, for example, I've been dealing with a chronic illness since I was eight. So I, I get severe pain. So 
does somebody or my exam, do I just take authority over it? How do I do that? And then if the pain comes back, do I just constantly keep it taking authority of it? Like, what do you do in that situation? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, one, Shani, is, um, you know, is to feed your heart, to feed your spirit with the healing scriptures, right? So I would take a few verses on healing and uh, meditate in the scriptures because, you know, the Bible says his word is healing to our whole body. Right? So God works by his word. So you take a few healing scriptures, scriptures on healing, just meditate in it. It's like, you know, how we would take medicine and the natural medicine. So you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, take this three times a day or once a day, whatever, you know. It's like, okay, you constantly feed it, take it. So once a day, twice a day, whatever you can, you take the healing scriptures, just read it, speak it over yourself, speak it over your body, speak it over, you know, whatever condition that is. And then you're, what you're expecting is you're expecting the word of God, which is medicine, healing, to work healing. So even as you read it, meditate in it. So what I, you know, I'm just giving example. So I could turn to Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, and I would say, Father, I thank you. You are the Lord who heals me. Then I would turn to Exodus 23, verse 25. So I read it and say, you know, the Lord blesses my bread and my water, and he removes all sickness away from my midst. Like this, we could go through many healing scriptures. You, know, you could go to Psalm 103, verse 3. God forgives all my sins, and he has healed me of all my diseases. You know, you could go to Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5. Surely Jesus took my sicknesses and carried away all my illnesses. The punishment to bring me wholeness was upon him. And by his wounds, I have been healed. Right? And then you come to the New Testament, you could read more scriptures, you know, Romans 8, verse 11. The Holy Spirit lives in me. He gives life to my mortal body. The life of God fills every cell in my body. My body is healed. My body is whole. My body is for the Lord. And the Lord is for my body. So like this, you, know, you go through certain and just speak that word over, you, over your physical body. And second is you resist that sickness, that illness, whatever that is. Say so in the name of Jesus, I speak to this condition. You have no place in my body. In the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. I declare you have no place in my body. You know, so you're, you're engaging your faith against that sickness. You know, and I continue to speak like until the healing manifest okay thank you that helps okay. all right thank you uh, all right sit Kenu. pass in christ we are justified and righteous become righteous of god can still yes was and tempt us or will be saved so um okay so sit Kenu's question is we are the righteousness of god can satan still tempt us so the answer is yes, you know, we, because we are living here on earth, we are basically on enemy territory, so to speak. You know, we are in here where Satan and his demons are operating and all the, you know, all the sin around us. So obviously we will be tempted. So in the spirit, we are the righteousness of God, but we're still living in our, we still have a mind in our body, which is, you know, exposed to everything around us. So will there be temptations? Yes, but we can overcome. We will talk about that, you know, in a, uh, in, in, in a future section when we talk about overcoming sin, how we overcome sin, okay? Okay, so one more question. In Christ, we just when righteous, become the righteous God can. Okay, so that's that's a question I've, we just answered. Okay, all right. 
Any other questions from anybody else? Dobi, Loba, yeah, Roslyn, Aradhana, Jafina, John. Others have asked questions. Ruben, Pema, Anita, Nicholson. Any questions? Isaac, Leah, Alan, Rebecca, Elisha, Collins, Paul, Subhashish. Any questions from any of anybody? Uh, thank you for those who have asked questions. It's good to ask questions. That's enough for today. Today, no question. Okay. Thank you, Elisha. No questions. Okay. Anyone else? You have, you have been so explicit that you have put us beyond questions. But now we don't have questions because your explanations are so explicit. You are awesome. May God bless you with more wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. God bless you. Uh, and really appreciate our brothers who are joining us from uh, at different parts of Africa. You know, uh, it's like... Uh, I think uh, it must be very early in the morning. So really appreciate their sacrifice in joining us. Nicholson, yes, please go ahead. Sorry. Can you hear me, Pastor? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Uh, Pastor, so just out of experience of what happens here, um, just want to clarify something now. When, like, they cast up, when we cast out demons here, there are different types of demons which manifest. Like some, like a recent one was one was the I don't know the the pastor said it was the like a suicidal spirit. So it was trying to choke the person while we were casting him out. And some I mean each demon behaves differently uh, while that happens. And uh, what I wanted to know was some of them say it's important to study what type of demon it is and uh, how to address each demon i know that we already have authority like you said to cast them out but is it necessary that we go into the study of how each uh, demon manifests or does it help us in any way or wh what would you say do we have to really go into that and study deep mm -hmm. uh, good question my response to that is, you know, we should just follow the example of Jesus, how Jesus ministered. And you don't find Jesus, you know, probing too much. He doesn't. Most of the time, when the Bible says, you know, he cast out evil spirits, just, just as he cast it out, you know, he laid hands or he prayed or he cast it out. So in some cases, he may ask, what is your name? You know, or... How long has this man suffered like this? That's that's about all we see Jesus going. You know, not more than that. You know. So I would also, and I would say, let's just follow Jesus. Let's not get carried away by a lot of people. See, people create a lot of things based on their experiences, and their experiences could be many, diverse, and it's interesting to read their experiences. But we don't have to model ourselves based on their experience, we should model ourselves based on Jesus. So I would say, let's just do it the way Jesus did it. He didn't spend too much time, you know, trying to understand those things. He just said, come out, you know. Uh, so usually what we do is that's our approach. These spirits have to leave. Now we know that uh, they are stubborn. They may oppose they may want to stay long, but we always operate from a place of dominion, authority, and don't worry, don't get into, uh, you know, trying to uh, understand the person's background and how did these demons come in. But Jesus didn't do those things. So why should we, you know, just follow the example of Jesus? That Thank would be, you know, yeah. uh, that's the best to do, best thing to do. Yeah. Uh, I know you have just one minute, but a quick thing. Another problem is like sometimes there are people who you cast out the demon and they are delivered, but sometimes the demon comes back. So is there something missing? They know the word of God, you shared the gospel. Hmm. So what do you do there? Yeah, so in those cases, the, 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 the couple of things. One, of course, is that person needs to, you know, and Jesus mentioned this in Matthew 12, 
he mentioned, you know, and demons are cast out. If, if he finds a place cleaned up, uh, there's a tendency to come back. But we need to have the person put their defenses up, you know, and say, okay, don't go back. Most important, don't go back and do the things that the person was doing in the past, which gave access, you know. A example, if there's an unclean spirit and this person was indulging in pornography, you know, he's delivered, but if he goes back, to doing that, it's going to open the door again, and it may even become worse. Right? So we should be very clear to that. Don't go back to the same things, you know, whatever it is, if it's in form of worship, it's a certain habits, things, don't go back to it. And the doors must be kept closed. Uh, and that, 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 that um, instruction must be given. Now, uh, 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 we do have that course coming up. I think I don't know whether it's in this semester or next. When we're talking about uh, you know healing and deliverance, and we'll get into some of those details there, right? Okay. Uh, Thank right. you. Welcome. Let's wrap up. I know we're a little over time, so let's pray and we will uh, dismiss. Get ready for our next class. Okay. Uh, let me ask somebody who's never prayed. Oh, I'm just trying to see. I don't know if um, uh, Anita Govakar, Anita Govakar, would you like to pray and dismiss us? Yes, yes Pastor. Go ahead. Father God, thank you for this amazing session, Father. We'd like to give everything in your hand, Father. Thank you for teaching us so many things that we never learned about this, Father. Thank you for the pastor, Father. Thank you for everything that you taught us, Father, today about your right, righteousness in, your, in you, Father. Thank you for everything that you did in our life, Father. Thank you for uh, that whatever we've learned in this uh, session, Father, we are going to apply that in your life, Father. The authority that you have given us in Christ, Father, thank you for that. And we are going to uh, walk according to that authority, Father. Thank you for everyone, those who have joined, Father. Thank you for the pastor, Father. Uh, we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Sorry for keeping a little longer. Uh, take your break and please join your next class. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. God bless. God bless everyone. Bye now. <laughs>